Welcome again. This is Lecture 6 of Biological Psychology, The Brain, Structure and Development. My name is Bruce Porter. The vertebrate nervous system is compo com composed of a central nervous system and a peripheral nervous system. The central nervous system consists of the brain and the spinal cord. The peripheral nervous system consists of all the nerves outside of the brain and the spinal, spinal cord. The spinal cord is part of the central nervous system and found within the spinal cord are the nerves that communicate with sense organs and muscles below the level of the head. The spinal cord is segmented is a segmented structure and each segment sends sensory information to the brain and receives motor commands from the brain. The autonomic nervous system is a set of neurons that receives information and sends inf commands to the heart, the intestines, and the organs. And the autonomic nervous system is composed of two divisions. There's the sympathetic nervous system, or the fight or flight syndrome, which prepares the body for action. And there's the parasympathetic nervous system, which is the vegetative non-emergency non system. In general, the parasymp parasympathetic uh, nervous system is just the opposite and generates just the opposite activity as the sympathetic nervous system. The cerebral cortex here it consists of cellular la layers on the outer surface of the cerebellum, of the cerebral hemispheres, excuse me. The corpus callosum, the corpus callosum is a set of axons that connects the two hemispheres. Right down there in the middle, there's a set of ner uh, nerves that connect these two hemispheres called the corpus callosum. The cerebral cortex consists of a higher percentage of uh, brains in primates uh, like monkeys and apes and humans than in other species. So basically, primates have larger brains. The cerebral cortex can be divided into four lobes, and the lobes are named for the skull bones that cover them. There is the occipital lobe, the parietal lobe, the temporal lobe, and the frontal lobe. The occipital lobe, the one in the back of our skull, is part of the visual pathway system. The m most rear, the most posterior of the occipital lobe uh, is where m major part of our vision is, and destruction of this part of the occipital lobe can call, cause what's called cortical blindness. The parietal lobe, uh, which lies between the occipital lobe and the frontal lobe there, um, it's the primary target for touch sensation and information from uh, muscle stretch receptors and joint receptors. The parietal lobe monitor monitors all of the information about eye, head, and body positions and passes, passes this information on to the brain areas that control movement. The temporal lobe, uh, located laterally, so we have one on each side, uh, n near our temples is the primary target for auditory information. In, human, uh, in humans, the temporal lobe, usually on the left hemisphere, is involved in the comprehension of spoken language. The temporal lobe also contributes to complex aspects of vision, including the perception of movement and the recognition of faces. The temporal lobe is also implicated in emotional and motivated behaviors. Our frontal lobe, located in the front, which is why, you know, frontal lobe, uh, and extends all the way out to the parietal lobe and into the temporal lobe there. Uh, the primary motor cortex is in our prefrontal lobe. It's uh, specialized for fine motor movements, primarily on the contralateral side, so the opposite side, the left side of your frontal lobe controlling the right side of your body. The prefrontal cortex, the most front part of this, forms the largest part of the brains in large brain species. So in the uh, primates specifically, it's the prefrontal cortex that is very large. It receives information from all of our senses. A disconnecting of the prefrontal cortex from the rest of the brain is called uh, a prefrontal lobotomy. And this practice has almost completely been, been abandoned because of uh, effective drug treatments. Prefrontal lobotomy, lobotomies 
commonly resulted in a loss of ability to plan and take initiative, in memory disorders and distractibility, and a loss of emotional expression. In addition, people with prefrontal damage lost their social inhibitions and often acted impulsively. Here's a picture of Phineas Gage, who we'll talk about in classroom, who had a, pretty much a self-inflicted prefrontal lobotomy. The prefrontal cortex is now believed to be important for working memory, that is the ability to remember recent events. The delayed response task, got to skim through this real quick here, Oop, there we are. Uh, a delayed response task, a subject must remember a stimulus, that is a toy or something like that, hidden prior to the introduction of a time delay. Damage to the prefrontal cortex leads to deficits in this task. So something could come up and you see it for a moment, you look away, and you don't remember what it was. And the prefrontal cortex is also believed to be important for context de dependent uh, behaviors, behaviors that you do within a certain time. Then how do all these parts work together? This is called the binding problem. Um, another term for it is large-scale integration. The question of how the, the visual, auditory, and the other areas of your brain influence one another to produce a combined perception of a single object. Binding occurs when you perceive two sensations coming from the same place at the same time. The human central nervous system begins to form when the embryo is about two weeks old. A neural tube forms around a fluid-filled cavity. This structure eventually sinks under the skin surface and develops into the hindbrain, the midbrain, and the forebrain. The fluid-filled cavity becomes the central canal and the four ventricles. So if we look at this spiral diagram, here's the process of brain development as it slowly goes around and the embryo develops into a full-fledged brain, the process of the development. The human brain weighs approximately 350 grams at birth in around 1,000 grams, grams at one year of age. The average adult brain weighs between 1,200 and 1,400 grams. There's five steps to the neural development. The first step is called proliferation, and this is the production of new cells. Cells along the, the ventricles of the brain divide to become the neurons in other cells of the brain and then they begin to migrate, step number two. Uh, these were these cells, the movement of these primitive neurons toward their final destination. The cells actually move within the brain. And as these cells get to where they are, they begin a process called differentiation, where neurons develop an axon and dendrites, and this distinguishes neurons from other cells in the body. The axons grow before the dendrites, while the neuron is migrating toward its destination. And then the neurons start working on their myelina myelinization. This is the glia cells that are other cells that are within our brain. They start producing myelin sheaths that go around and encase the axons, which allow for rapid transmission of information. In, hu in humans, myelin uh, form, the first, uh, form first in the spinal cord before forming in the brain. Myelination begins during the prenatal period and continues into adulthood. And then we get into synaptogenesis, which is the formation of synapses, formation of gaps between the presynaptic terminal and the postsynaptic terminal. And this last step in neural development continues throughout life. And finally, we have a fully developed neuron. Now the traditional belief was that adult vertebrate brains gain all their neurons during early, de early development and could only lose neurons in later life. Now postsynaptic cells strengthen the synapses of some cells and weaken the synapses of other cells. Compared to the mature brain, the developing brain is more vulnerable to malnutrition, 
and toxic chemicals and infection. A case in point is fetal alcohol syndrome. It's caused by alcoholic consumption during pregnancy. Symptoms include decreased alertness, hyperactivity, facial abnormalities, mental retardation, motor problems, and heart defects. Prenatal exposure to cocaine can lead to uh, decrease in IQ scores and a somewhat uh, greater decrease in language skills. Prenatal exposure to cigarette smoking is associated with attention deficit, hyperactivity disorder, ADHD, aggression, impaired memory and intelligence, and stress to the mother has also been found to cause academic and social problems for her offspring. Because of the unpredictability of life, we've evolved, evolved the ability to redesign our brains within limits in response to experience. Experience uh, and dendrite branching. Environmental enrichment leads to a thicker cortex, more dendri dendritic branching and improved performance on learning tasks. Much of the benefit of enriched environment is simply due to activity. Increased size, expan increased size expansion of neurons has also been demonstrated in humans as a function of physical activity. Enriched environments enha enhance enhances the sprouting of axons and dendrites in a wide variety of species, not just humans. People blind from birth are better at discriminating between objects by touch and have an increased activ activation in their occipital cortex, their visual cortex, while performing this task. And we know that extensive practice of a particular skill makes a person more adept at that skill. In a few cases, researchers have identified brain changes that are associated with increased expertise at a particular skill. For example, the auditory cortex response to pure tones is twice as large, twice as large for professional musicians as for non-musicians. Moreover, a part of the temporal cortex was found to be 30% larger in professional musicians. Violin players have a larger area devoted to the left fingers uh, than non-musicians. And every so often, brain reorganization goes a little bit too hard. There's uh, something called focal hand dystonia, which is also known as musician's cramp. This happens in musicians who practice extensively when the expanded representation of each finger overlaps its neighbor. The fingers become clumsy, fatigue easily, make involuntary movements that interfere with a desired task. A similar condition called writer's cramp can happen to, happen to people who spend all day writing. Brain damage can result from a number of causes including tumors, infections, exposure to radiation or toxic substances, uh, and degenerative condi conditions such as Parkinson's and Al Al Alzheimer's, a closed head injury, and a sharp blow on the head that doesn't actually puncture the brain, which is the most common cause of brain damage in young people. Closed head injury damage, uh, injuries damage the brain because of the rotational forces that drive the brain tissue against the inside of the skull. A temporary loss of blood flow, uh, it was a stroke in the brain. This is a common cause of brain damage. There's is ischemia, is the most type, uh, common type of stroke, which is the loss of blood flow caused by a blood clot. And then there's a hemorrhage. Uh, it's a less common type of smoke, uh, stroke where bleeding due to a rupture. Uh, decreasing cell death after a stroke can be accomplished by administering uh, clot-busting drugs that restore the blood flow or by using drugs that uh, antagonize glutamate activity. However, research have dis researchers have, have discovered that the most effective method for decreasing cell death in animals is to lower brain temperature 
from 98 degrees Fahrenheit to 84 degrees Fahrenheit uh, within 30 minutes after the stroke. Behavioral uh, deficits due to stroke can sometimes be improved with the use of uh, stimulant uh, medication. Uh, under certain circumstances, damaged axons can grow back. However, the regeneration is minimal in mature mammals and possibly because of a large amount of scar tissue or the secretion of growth inhibiting chemicals. Sprouting is a normal condition as the brain is constantly adding new branches of axons and dendrites and withdrawing old ones. This process accelerates in response to damage. Collateral sprouts are uh, a newly formed branch of an uninjured axon. The collateral sprouts attach to a synapse vacated when the original axon was destroyed. People with brain damage generally show some behavioral improvement after the damage. This recovery is due to structural changes in the brain uh, in the surviving neurons and learned changes in behavior. The visual cortex is remapped following the loss of neurons in the upper left visual field. Reorganization, uh, reorganized sensory representations and phantom limbs. We have this organization in our brain about what area of the brain represents what part of the body. And here's just a visual representation of this. Brain scans confirm that this process often, often leads to a phantom limb uh, pain, a uh, phantom limb sensation, even after the part has been fully amputated. The brain remains plastic throughout life, however. Learned adjustments in behavior, where much of the recovery after brain damage is learned, the individual makes better use of the unimpaired abilities. A brain damaged person or animal may also use abilities that first appear lost but are only impaired. <laughs>